and welcome to the 2020 Ohio Anna Book Festival. I'm Bill Eichenberger, a writer and editor for the Ohio History Connections membership publication Echoes Magazine. I'm pleased to welcome you to the festival's Ohio History panel discussion. We want to thank our festival sponsors and partners, all of whom you can find listed um, on the Ohio Anna website. And thanks to our official bookseller, The Book Loft of German Village, you can get copies of all the books featured at the festival, including our authors today, uh, by going online to bookloft.com. And now I'm pleased to welcome our authors. Um, Tim Carroll is the author of World War II Akron. Uh, born and raised in Akron, Ohio, Tim attended Akron Public Schools before earning a history degree uh, from the University of Akron. Both of his grandfathers, John M. Carroll, and John F. Ward served in the Pacific during the war. Um, Kathleen Fernandez is the author of Zor, the story of an international community. Um, Kathleen has been intrigued by the German religious separatists who settled the village of Zor, Ohio, since she began working there in 1975. Her first book, A Singular People, Images of Zor, won the Distinguished Publication Award from the Communal Studies Association in 2004. Uh, Elise Myers Walker and David Walker are the authors of Historic Black Settlements of Ohio. A graduate of Miami and Ohio State Universities, David uh, has written a number of local histories as well as several novels and works for the stage. He was recently inducted into the Ohio Senior Citizens Hall of Fame for his contributions to local history. His daughter Elise is a graduate of Hofstra University and Ohio University and has with her father on a dozen local history clues. He's trying to say um, it's Marcy really Rich awesome. Is <laughs> <laughs> You've linked out uh, a little bit. Right. Elise Myers Walker <laughs> is really awesome, was where you were headed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is really awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, um, Marcy Rich is the author of Looking Back at Illyria, a, Mid a Midwestern city at mid century. Marcy has published poetry essays in journalism. She has earned honors from the Academy of American Poets, blog Her, the Huffington Post, and the Press Club of Cleveland. She twice won Best Freelance Writer in Ohio Awards in 2018 and 2019 in the Press Club's All Ohio Excellence in Journalism competition for her local history feature series, Look Back Illyria, which she writes for the Chronicle Telegram and which forms the, formed the basis of this, her first book. Um, so, uh, I wanted to just start by asking each one, and let's start, uh, let's just do it alphabetically. Um, uh, Tim, can you tell me uh, how you chose this subject, why you found it interesting, why you found it important to tell this, I guess I was going to say this story, but I mean these particular set of stories. Uh, yeah, I wrote a book about my grandfather's World War II experience, and uh, the publisher liked it, but they uh, weren't sure that it would sell. And they had wrote a, they had written a book called World War II Cleveland, and I wanted to uh, publish my first book, so I asked them if I could write World War II Akron, and since they liked what I wrote about my grandfather, they said they would give me a contract to write it, which was kind of a surprise to me because uh, I hadn't written the book at all, so they gave me a contract to write it without ha having written anything. And so I went, I was excited, and I went full throttle doing research for about eight months, uh, about every uh, every single day, and. Uh, I find a lot of interesting material for the book. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff about the men who served, who were killed in action. And the draft really surprised me. They drafted fathers during World War II, age 18 to 37. I think that has surprised a lot of people. Uh, you could even get drafted up to age 45. So I found men who were being killed when they were 43, 44. Uh, right. Fathers of five kids who were like 33 were, were being sent into action and killed. Uh, and it was the first time they lowered the draft age to 18 during the war. Uh, World War I was 21 to 35. So that was also very interesting. And uh, it was just an a interesting perspective. You know, Akron made blimps that hunted subs and, and did all kinds of stuff. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but that kind of gives up, uh, gives you an idea of uh, some of the stuff that's in the book. Right. That's terrific. Um, uh, uh, Kathy, tell me about your lifelong, almost adult lifelong uh, love affair with Zor. Uh, well, it is definitely a love affair. Um, I started working there as a child um, in 1975 and um, having, having to interpret the the story of the Zor separatists to our visitors 
just got me more and more interested to know more and more about what Zor was. And so a lot of the research that went into both of my books you know, started, started a long time ago. And, uh, but there, was, there has never been really a comprehensive history of Zor. And so that's mm -hmm. what this book is purported to be. And um, uh, to give you the history from their beginnings in Germany until really today, uh, about the town. Of course, the community ended in 1898 as a communal society, but it still is a community today and, of course, a great place to visit. Yep. Oh, so, Elise and, and David, um, uh, the same question for you. What, what, how did you um, uh, hit upon uh, historic Black settlements of Ohio and, and what drew you to it? You know, what well, kept, you, kept you doing it? I'll answer the question. Um, my mother grew up in New Bremen, Ohio, mm -hmm. which is up in northwestern Ohio in Auglaize County. And it isn't very far from Carthagena and Rumley, which were two of the major black settlements in Ohio prior to the Civil War. And my mother was always telling me tales, especially of Carthagena. So I've had an interest in it forever. And then maybe three years ago, I was visiting my wife's cousin, and she mentioned they had this a book that was written about an African-American slave. And I had written or written, I had read probably 50 different slave narratives. And I wanted to see this. So they dug it out and it turned out to be one I wasn't familiar with. And it was published in Lima, Ohio. And it wasn't actually a slave narrative. It was written by the slave's husband and son after she died. And in it, she talks about life in Carthagena because she lived there for a number of years, only she doesn't identify it as such. And I realized where it was just from the geographical description of the distances from the different cities. And wow. so I thought that's cool. And I wanted to do an, an annotated version of it, but publishers weren't interested in that. So I suggested this book and we try to draw together as many of these communities as we, oh. as we could because there was you know, probably around a hundred. Now, yeah. now, do it correctly. You have done an annotated version of it. Oh, so yeah. if anyone knows a publisher <laughs> who is interested, that is yet unpublished. But this this was published on yeah. Historic Black Settlements of Ohio. So we pulled together information on about 40 of them, uh, just because nothing had been done like that before. And we found them, found them so fascinating. Right. Um, um, yeah, we like to tell the history of, um, as much as possible, the people that you don't hear about the most. The the, um, you know, uh, and this one with the black settlements, but also women is a group that we frequently talk about as well. The, the marginalized groups that don't often get talked about in history classes. Right, not often enough. <laughs> um, uh, Marcy, why don't you go ahead and take the, the last stab at this first question. Um, well, Elyria is my hometown. It is the <laughs> county seat of Lorain County. It's about 30 miles southwest of Cleveland for those who aren't familiar with it. And three years ago, Illyria was celebrating its bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of its founding by Heman Ely. And I had been freelancing for the, uh, the city's daily newspaper, the Chronicle Telegram. And my editor asked me if I'd like to contribute some articles to the, uh, to the paper for its bicentennial supplement. And I thought, well, of course, this would be a great idea. And it sounds like a lot of fun. Um, but it's also the fact that it's my hometown. I was born and raised there. My father was born and raised there. But the thing is, this book came about by accident because I was in the early stages of writing a memoir. I call myself an accidental historian, and I'm a little humbled to be sitting here with all of you valid historians, um, because I'm more of a memoirist and a journalist. Uh, in fact, book is essentially a choral memoir um, of a very specific place in a very specific era, mid-century. And as such, it's informed by uh, as much by the recollections of other people as by my memories. So in that sense, it's, uh, it's a history, but it's also a memoir and a, and a work of journalism. Um, I'm, I would like to turn to um, all of your research. Um, and I'll start uh, with David and Elise. Uh, in the um, 
the the text for uh, for your for dust I guess it's a dust jacket or whatever for your book. You say that um, these these historic black settlements um, uh, little is known about them. How, how did you uh, how, and how did you put it together? I mean, it sounds like that was a challenge. Yes, it was a challenge, uh, and the most disappointing aspect of it is what is known about them is largely from the white standpoint. Mm -hmm. Right. Many of these settlements were created because uh, slaveholders were freeing their slaves. And, you know, if you had slaves in Virginia, you couldn't free them in Virginia. You had to take them someplace and leave right. them. And, right. so, and some of it was in their will. Some, they actually did it. Sometimes they were just dumped here. Sometimes they were sent here and land was purchased for them and they were given you know, an opportunity to, to start. So you start with you know, uh, what is known about a lot of the slaveholders that they gave their slaves away, uh, or freedom. Uh, but also, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of slave narratives, we went through those. Mm -hmm. You look through county histories. You now, prior to 1900, you could probably count on one hand Ohio County histories that mentioned to any significant degree the African-American population within that county. But there are a few exceptions. And since then, in the early part of the century, when they started doing revised county histories, they started including some of that and in some of them. So it's just a matter of going through all of that, plus you know, a lot of newspaper archives and pulling together what you can from yeah, it. Yeah, we also had a lot of court records. Um, another book that we are working on had to do with the um, court cases surrounding um, uh, slaves that had escaped, uh, enslaved right. people who had escaped. And so that's, that's not published yet. Um, but <laughs> that's one that we've been working on. And as a result, we were going through court cases where, you know, people were trying to basically take people back, uh, into slavery. And a lot of times it says where they ran to and where they ran to may have been where there was a black settlement, where they ran to may have been where there was some existing community, either that they knew from before or they just knew people that might protect them there, that kind of thing. So we were able to find some stuff with that. I think um, it, it exists in the historical record, but it's sketchy. What we really meant by um, not well known though, is how the people that live on this land now in these communities have many times have no idea, unless they're a descendant of one of the enslaved people who is there, they might have no idea. Um, Dad had a conversation with someone who was standing directly across the street from where there's a historical marker about the community talking to him and the man who grew up in the area had no idea just just no concept of it and again it goes back to that you know what what are we teaching we definitely are teaching everybody's story even though I, we feel we say often black history is american history you know it's it's all of our history as americans we need to know these things but uh, yeah, it's usually the, the white male story that's the one that gets told. Right, right. Um, Marcy, I'm assuming that you uh, relied heavily on uh, newspapers for your piece. Uh, t tell me about your research. Oh, you're muted. I'm glad you asked about the research because newspapers were integral to to my research for this book. The Chronicle Telegram maintains a very robust digital archives and I was able to access that from my home computer. You know, 21st century technology allowed me to write this book about mid-century uh, Illyria. Um, so what I was finding in researching these articles, and this is where the journalism comes into play, a name would pop out in a story and I wondered, is that person still alive? Mm. I'm wondering if there's a chance that I can find them, track them down. And so it was a combination of newspaper research and just good old fashioned journalistic chops, you know, yeah. using old phone directories, whitepages.com sometimes. And in several instances, I was able to track a person down who has written about 50 some 60 years ago and wow. get their stories so these are really so when i say this is a choral memoir it really is because i'm bringing together the recollections of many different people and as i was doing my research and again i have to say 
being a native of Elyria, I thought I knew the city, but I learned so much that I didn't know. And right. my research also created other questions like, how did we use the telephone back in the 50s and 60s? Mm -hmm. How did we shop? Um, what was it like to go to the movies? And then more sobering questions, such as how many Illyria men died in the Vietnam War. So these formed the chapters for my book, but it was all based and rooted in journalism. I'm, I'm imagining you in an archive somewhere and you've spent a couple of hours not really coming up with quite what you're looking for. And you say, well, if I just look through one more roll of, of microfilm, I think maybe I'm going to find something. Did that ever happen? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was doing some research at the Illyria Public Library looking through old yearbooks. I was doing wow. an article on a dance teacher. And there it was. There was her picture, her senior picture The um, in the 30s they the editors had ascribed um epigrams to each graduate and hers was well i'm gonna have to try to read it to you if i can because it sure. was really charming um because it was so apropos for her as a person mm -hmm. that, all right so betty bishop was her name and she graduated from Elyria high school in 1937 even then she had dreamt of being a dancer and teaching dance. Her, the epigraph for her read like something out of Shakespeare if, say, Ophelia or Juliet had been dancers. Thou takest to dancing, fair damsel, thy feet are thy fortune. Thou hast made a way for thyself in the world by teaching others to be graceful and to make use of their feet. I mean, That's beautiful. <laughs> you're, you're, oh no, senior yearbooks today, they're not, they don't do that. No. <laughs> but, 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 but I, you know, was sitting in the library, just waiting and being patient and going through these yearbooks. And there I found it. So a lot of it is, is patience and perseverance. Right. Now, now Kathy, uh, when we talk about Zor, there's been quite a bit, a good deal of scholarship done on Zor, hasn't there? But, but what were your challenges as a researcher? Well, language, for one thing. Um, right, German. <laughs> Zora is German. And, um, uh, but frankly, there really has not been a whole lot of research on Zora compared okay. yeah. to, to other historic communal sites. And um, so that was probably the, but language is probably the biggest challenge. But fortunately, the um, Ohio History Connection, or at that time, the Ohio Historical Society, yes, yeah. um, um, acquired a, a large group of papers in the early 2000s and along with them they were able to to uh, get someone to translate a lot of them and so and but those papers had really never been studied so that that was a, a kind of the backbone of this new book was the fact that I was able to use these papers that really no one had had taken a look at and um, and add that information to to you know to the record but as I mentioned before there really is was not a uh, a narrative history of Zor that other historians could go to and say you know this I'll, I'll use this as, as the backbone and then I'm going to amplify on top of that but there wasn't that sort of thing so therefore Zor unlike a lot of other historic sites, even German ones, um, the, it was kind of the redheaded stepchild. It, no one really knew about it. So Zor was always a little footnote in, in the history because that information wasn't out there. So I'm hoping that that's what, that this, that's what this book can be. That can, that can remedy that situation. Now, have, have, has the German been translated? Uh, is there still lots in German that you have to know 19th century, a, a certain kind of German to translate? Uh, well, it's German, what's called German script. It's a different uh, way of making letters than, than, the, than English script. There are people who know it. You have to, mm. you have to figure out who they are um, right. and, and, and so forth. Um, but what got translated was 
in, in many cases, it wasn't word for word kind of translation. Mm -hmm. It was thumbnail translation. So you knew that, the, you know, this letter was about raising apples or whatever. Right. And uh, so if you wanted to know more, then I had several friends that I could send this, send it to and have them, you know, have them translate it for me. Right. Tim, you, you had mentioned um, uh, uh, doing a lot of research on a daily basis over eight months. What, where did you go to, where did you find your information? Uh, the newspaper archives were great. Uh, that was one of the best sources for me. The Akron Beacon Journal did a great job of covering the war. Uh, they always interviewed families when there was a prisoner of war, missing in action, wounded, and of course uh, the 1,500 some uh, men, men and three women that were killed in, in the war. So there was a lot of great information on everybody who served, uh, killed, wounded, and whatnot. And also the stuff Akron was doing, you know, the war bond rallies uh, and the stuff Akron made. Uh, so it was really a, a great resource. They did a fantastic job. As you can imagine, the reporters had a tough task in interviewing, you know, 1,500 some uh, families that, of people that were killed. So that alone is a, quite a task. But they, uh, they did a great job of documenting what happened to those people and getting feedback uh, um, from those families. So I did a good job of documenting, you know, uh, uh, the, the killed in action, the wounded, and, and telling, telling those stories. And uh, telling other stories of like the war bond rallies, like Fred Astaire came through Ohio, uh, Marlene Dietrich, and uh, j just you know the if you ever seen the movie Flags of Our Fathers, uh, the flag that that movie is about the flag raisers touring America on a war bond rally. Well, they came through every major city, including Akron, Ohio, during the uh, during the war. So I have photos of that and just stories about those war bond rallies. Even the B uh, B seventeen Memphis Bell, which is pretty famous. Uh, if you're famous in World War II, they sent you back to sell war bonds. So their, their plane flew across the country and including the stops in Akron, Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Dayton, and you could go, uh, you could go see the plane. And if you want an autographed picture of all, all 10 members of the crew, that would cost about a thousand dollar war bond. Same thing for Fred Astaire. If you wanted a thousand dollar war, if you wanted to have dinner with Fred Astaire, it cost you a thousand dollar war bond to be at dinner with Fred. So uh, it was pretty cool to learn about the war bond rallies and some of the famous people that were touring during the time period. In fact, people like Fred Astaire were told that they were never allowed to give an autograph out for free. That uh, anytime they gave an autograph out, it had to be for a war bond. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. Uh, they were working for the government, so none of the actors give out a uh, autograph for free. Right. Did did um uh, did does Goodyear keep a good history of its own uh, its own past, or did you find oh, elsewhere? Yeah, and that, that's another resource that was great for me is they donated all their archives to the University of Akron. So it's uh, very well preserved. So I did find uh, like uh, all my blimp photos are from their archives at the University of Akron and they have a ton of resources down there. And it's uh, uh, and being in Akron, it's nice because I can go down there and I can look through all the material where somebody out of town would probably have to pay the University of Akron to look through some of the boxes and whatnot. So that was helpful to me in doing the research. And I have a lot of unique blimp photos. Uh, hunting subs, passing the rock at Gibraltar when they sent some across the Atlantic to uh, work in the Mediterranean, uh, one over the leading tower of Pisa when they were in the Mediterranean. And uh, they were in the Pacific, Gulf of Mexico, and the Germans were sinking a lot of shipping on the East Coast, and they even went into the Gulf of Mexico. So they had blimps uh, in the Gulf of Mexico all along the East Coast, and they were really instrumental in trying to get the Germans out of the East Coast when they were sinking a lot of shipping uh, in 1942. So yeah, good. I didn't know that, you know, I think at least talked about how history is not taught that well in school. And uh, from somebody from Akron, it would have really fascinated me that blimps were hunting subs during World War II. And we never learned that in school. Uh, I just right. was uh, you know, really fascinated by that when I found it, that uh, Goodyear was making blimps armed with machine guns and depth charges to go after uh, subs. That's fantastic. H Kathy, what made um, Azor uh, in, in, uh, a, a unique or a significant um, community? in the 19th century i'm not sure exactly what you're what you're aiming at um i'm wondering uh it was one of the longest lasting communal uh, groups in the u.s wasn't it yes so but i i guess what i'm wondering is um well what what and why is it so little known is it you know compared to some of the other that have gotten more of the spotlight um, gee, I don't, it's prob probably the fact that, that the scholars that have, have, um, you know, written about the other communities just were not in Zor. I mean, mm -hmm. when I was working there, the, 
the best resource on Zohar had been written in 1933 wow. uh, as a dissertation by a, dis by a historian who was also a descendant. And that's, you know, that's pretty much all there was. There were, you know, a few other, other pieces and parts, um, but, but there wasn't. And, and again, language is another problem. I mean, the papers were there and they had been preserved, but um, they kind of languished uh, because they hadn't been translated or no one really cared about, about translating them. So, uh, but Enzor, of course, wasn't, you know, wasn't the Shakers. Um, mm -hmm. it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't even the Harmony Society um, uh, in Pennsylvania and Indiana and then Pennsylvania again, um, who, uh, who had a historian who translated every single letter that they ever wrote. Uh, and historians are still using his primary resources today um, to, you know, again, to amplify uh, mm -hmm. and, and, to, and to get that information out there. Um, but Zor has some pluses too, because it's probably one of the most complete as far as the physical uh, plant. Um, Right. And it has, you know, some, has wonderful artifacts and buildings and so forth, where a lot of other historic sites do not have, you know, do not have that. So um, there's pluses, pluses and minuses. And of course, it has a, a, a great champion in, in the state of Ohio and, and the Ohio History Connection that right. has put a lot of money and effort and so forth into preserving it. Mm -hmm. Marcy, what, what's... Um... What would you? What were you hoping to achieve um, with your book? Um, I know from our magazine that our uh, Ohio History Connection members just love to connect with history in a way that, like, we actually just in an upcoming for an upcoming issue, we've asked people what was what was your first drive-in movie experience, and I'm wondering, you know, you know. I think there's going to be a lot of thrills for people who grew up, you know, in, uh, in your area that they're going to have a lot of memories stoked. Is that, well, tell me a little bit about, you know, what, what your book does. Uh, I think. Um, you, you muted by mistake. I'll begin again. What um, the process of writing my book did for me uh, it allowed me to reclaim um, the best parts of my childhood. I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and I call that my sweet spot. And one of the things that I found, there was enthusiasm building as I was writing these articles, and they were published in the Chronicle. More and more people were getting very interested. Mm -hmm. And there's a Facebook group called Vintage Illyria, and another one called Connect Area. And that was another great resource for me because I could pop a question in there. Does anybody remember going to the paradise? And wow, people love to talk about their past. They love to talk about their youth. And, and that was what was so exciting as I was writing this book to find out how enthusiastic people were about Illyria. Uh -huh. um, that said, I would hope that people who didn't necessarily grow up in Elyria or even Northeast Ohio will get something out of this book because I think many of these stories are universal. You know, there's a chapter on the phone company, how we made phone calls, how we went to the library, the old corner store. Yeah, we, you know, we um, uh, uh, do this, the same thing in terms of, you know, we always say that you can't tell the story of America without telling the story of Ohio. And I think the same could probably be said of Illyria. You can't tell Ohio's story without telling the story. And it, it's got to be in some ways, um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for the word, the right word, but um, the things that you're talking about were really, really definitively, definitively of the mid-century. Yeah. I mean, is that, is that a fair... Oh, I think so. Um, for example, how were nurses educated? 
um, in the early part of the century up through the mid century of, of uh, the 20th century. And there was a, those, the hospital schools of nursing, that was the norm. Um, now that's not the case any longer. Now uh, a young man or woman goes to college and they get a bachelor of science in nursing degree. Um, but that's a different way of educating a nurse. And um, so I think a lot of people who, who went to the hospital back in those days recognized that they had a nurse who had trained at uh, MB Johnson School of Nursing. It was a different quality of care to the point where one woman I interviewed said that a patient looked at her and said, you went to a, a hospital school of nursing, didn't you? I can tell because you fluffed up my pillow. Um, <laughs> so little things like that. But also the Easter Seals was formed in Illyria. Um, in 1907, I believe it was, there was a horrible streetcar accident. And that was the impetus for starting Illyria Memorial Hospital. And one of the benefactors, um, Daddy Allen, um, founded the Gates Hospital for Crippled Children, also as a result of that accident. And that, in turn, became Easter Seals. That was the administrative fundraising wing. And uh, so that, Illyria does have that history. And we don't, we're not home to any presidents, though. So mm -hmm. we don't have that. Right. Um, uh, David and Elise, um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, settlements sounds a, a lot more impermanent than cities or towns or even villages or townships. Were, were these settlements fleeting or, or do some sort of still retain a little of the integrity or they would have had of them at their, their original b b formation or, or how, did, how did that work? Most were, I don't want to say fleeting, because there were people who lived their entire lives there, but right. um, if, if they existed at the same level or even the remnants existed of them in any functional way, they would be better known. So that's part of, of the disappearance of this history. Um, the what, the pro, there were a number of problems that they faced. Mm -hmm. uh, one was, they didn't always have title to the land that they were settled on. In right. some cases, the agent for the, the slave owner or his executor kept the title himself. Right. Or sometimes it was held in common, which meant that nobody owned it. Right. So they had a lot of tax issues and land was sold off to pay taxes because nobody actually mm -hmm. individual owned it. But what you had were a lot of people who they were brought here or came here prior to the Civil War because they were fleeing slavery. Mm -hmm. Neither the slaveholders were moving them, they were coming to a free state. They were dropped down, basically expected to survive by farming. Not all of them were farmers. Right. Those who were farmers weren't used to farming the kind of crops that you grow in Ohio. We're deep they, south farmers. Yeah, yeah they weren't, they, we don't grow cotton here. You know, we don't <laughs> grow a whole lot of tobacco except the, you know, along the river. And so those were challenges as well. They weren't really cut out to it. If they were household servants, they weren't farmers. So what you had is they were kind of refuges up until the Civil War. Then after the Civil War, you know, those who would prefer to work in the cities mm -hmm. went to the cities. Now that they could, could move freely. Which was right. especially the household servants because one of the areas open to them as Black Americans was hospitality. Right. And having been a house servant, to transition to a hotel or a lady's maid or that sort yeah, or of thing. Steamboats. Steamboats, yeah. Steam boats. yeah, trains, yeah. On trains. That was, so that was a very narrow sliver of, of career that they could yeah. move into that they were trained for. But, um, you know, they also might not want to stick around there. They might want to go find some family that they lost contact with, yeah. or they might want to, you know. In, in many cases, the land they were given or was purchased for them was not good farmland to begin with. Right. And so, you know, they, it was kind of subsistence living. So mm -hmm. that helped to drive them away. But right. in the case of Carthagena, you know, that was very rich farmland up in Northwestern Ohio. Mm -hmm. And there were German farmers around there. And if the, you know, the, the, if the African Americans who were sold there didn't want to farm, there were plenty of people they could sell the land to. Mm -hmm. And so in almost all cases, you know, by the beginning of the, the 20th century, 
they had lost their land. They had sold it or they had lost it because of you know, some machinations that were taking place, you know, legally to take it away from them. But right. so, so it went through their hands and there's very few, you know, people that are the ancestors of these mm -hmm. people still living on the same land that they did. I mean, it's very it's sparsely scattered around the country. There was also a fair amount of host, of uh, inhospitable of the hostility is the word I was looking for. A lot of hostility yeah. from the um, surrounding that here'd be your towns and, and cities of white people. You know, there was a lot yeah. of like not in my backyard. Yeah. I same same thing you hear with any uh, population of color right now. You know, oh, we'll take our jobs. Oh, they're gonna you know yeah. use up all our resources. You know, we're gonna have to carry them on our backs, that sort of thing was very prevalent at the time yeah. as well. That was especially true than those that settled in the southern mm -hmm. part of Ohio, mm -hmm. where there were a lot of southerners who would, from the you know, white settlers had settled. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get up into Carthagena, Carthagena was known for being a very harmonious mm -hmm. settlement. I mean, they were very well received up there. Uh, same could be said for Rumley and a few others, but most of them, you know, if they're really isolated, like you got some that were down in some of the, the mountainous areas of you know, Southern Ohio, they were eager to get out of there once they were free to do so. It was a good place to hide out, you know, if you were a fugitive slave, but you didn't want to well, st stay there if you're going to try to make a living. And you mentioned the harmony. There were also cases of um, the freed and slave people intermarrying with Native Americans or of uh, some of them especially um, ones who were products of um, uh, slave owner and, and slave, um, I, I won't, I won't uh, mince my words, so the rape that occurs in that scenario um, could have very, very light colored skin. And, you know, it's potential for them to disappear into other communities. Like I said, well, the Native American one, you know. Yeah, up in, in Greene County, especially, which had a large settlement, W. E. Du Bois went there specifically because he felt he had roots there. And this is about, you know, just after the beginning of the 20th century. And he was disturbed to see how white the people appeared because of the intermarriage. And that the, uh, the, the, the men, the, the, the whitest of the men, the women were leaving. They were going to Chicago where they were going to pass as white. Right. You know? So there was a lot of that going on too. So, you know, a lot of these ended up with very, very mixed populations. And mm -hmm. so, um just because of the people who had come there and intermarried with them right kathy i i want to make sure that uh, there i'm sure that a lot of people who are going to be watching this they might not know what zor was or what a separatist community was or communal society was can you just walk us through the the history of of zor sure um zor was german of course as we've mentioned um, and they were religious dissenters. Uh, the part of Germany that they were from, of course, Germany wasn't a unified country until 1870, uh, was Württemberg, and the ruler uh, determined the religion, and their religion was Lutheran. Uh, these folks did not want to belong to the Lutheran church, and so therefore they rebelled, but because the church and the state were so combined, when, when you didn't go to church, you were breaking the law. And uh, so they were thrown in jail. This was also during the time of Napoleon in, 18, um, in the early 1800s, in, early in, in 1800, starting in 1800. And after Napoleon um, was defeated, then they got permission to emigrate to the United States. Uh, they uh, took a ship from, from Antwerp, Belgium to Philadelphia, bought land sight unseen uh, in Tuscarawas County, Ohio, uh, tried rather badly to farm it uh, in individuals, you know, individually, uh, and then pay off the, their mortgage, but that didn't work. Um, and so in, eight, in April of 1819, they decided to become a communal society where everyone shared everything. So you didn't work for wages, you worked for the community, you were taken care of, um, you didn't have to worry about you know, um, buying anything, uh, your food and shelter and your clothing was all taken care of. And uh, it was because of the Ohio and Erie Canal, which they helped build seven miles through their land and also gave them a way to get their crops to market 
uh, they became very successful. And uh, they also had a very successful leader by the name of Joseph Beimler, who was not only their uh, religious leader, but also their business leader. And um, he died in 1853, but the community didn't dissolve right then. Uh, they stayed viable for actually longer than uh, after he died than, than before, but because they found no one to continue their religious beliefs the same mm -hmm. way that he could, uh, the, the society also turned to tourism uh, because it was easier to make money that way than to, to develop the cottage industries that they had. And uh, in 1898, they made the decision to disband the community. And then uh, through, the tw through the 20th century, uh, Zorb became, um, got a historical sense of itself and uh, the uh, Ohio History Connection has restored lots of buildings. And so you can now kind of get an idea of what life was like there. Well, Zor did that uh, amazing um, art exhibit from the, the painters from Cleveland who would go and spend their su summer times there and did painting these just spectacular uh, uh, landscapes and whatnot. That was really a great exhibit. And, and, and frankly, it's, it's also uh, artifacts too. It, tell, mm -hmm. it shows us, you know, some of them show what the furnishings looked like inside the houses, not only the outside, of some of the houses, but also some of the insides of the houses. And uh, it's, so it's documentary evidence as well. And it was really, it, in fact, actually some of those paintings are still on display yeah. um, in, in the Beimler house today. And you can get an idea of what Zora looked like. But yeah, Zora was looked on as kind of a romantic place. And you know, a lot of uh, journalists came and wrote about it. In fact, my first, that's my first book was about uh, was uh, coupling photographs taken of Zora with, with uh, quotations from, from diarists and journalists who visited Zor and, and, uh, and talked about it. So it, it, I don't know that most of them understood <laughs> how the community worked or why it, why it was what it was, but um, it, it's, it's a way to understand it because you, you can, you know, at least um, hear what people thought, you know, what, it, what the place looked like then and, uh, and get an idea where because the, the Zorites themselves were not diarists or not letter writers, right. Uh, right. and they really didn't leave us a whole lot of information about what their lives were like. Um, Marcy, uh, what do, did you find most useful? I mean, we, we talked about the research earlier. Um, you talked about doing that, uh, that legwork that every journalist has to do to maybe find people who were still alive. Um, I guess this is kind of two part question a little bit. Is it, did, did you, do you, did you prefer to get to talk to these people or was the research rewarding or both? And, and also you, tell me a, like your favorite story that you learned in doing this book. Oh boy, that's that's. I know. Good. Narrow it down. What? Who's your favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I loved both. I loved the research because I could just sort of disappear out of myself and go back in time. But I also loved talking to the people who lived those stories, and I, I really. I'm almost going to start to cry. Um, I could tell that many of the people that I was interviewing were so honored to be able to tell their stories. Mm. Um, one woman I interviewed was 99 years old at the time, and she was in a wheelchair. Um, she was a nurse at uh, Leary Memorial Hospital, and uh, she just she was a firecracker. She really was. <laughs> Um, it's gotta I, be a pistol to live to 99. <laughs> exactly. And I asked her what the secret was to such a long life. And she looked at me and she said, I never got married. I never had any kids. So um, knowing that I was doing something to preserve their stories for them, that meant a lot to me. It was an honor to tell their stories and to have these people share their photographs with me. 
you know, many of them just sure here, take this. And I would take the photos, come home, scan them, and then drive back and return them. Yeah. Um, so it was, you know, it was a real sense of trust that mm -hmm. um, I had throughout this process. But as far <laughs> as any particularly <laughs> favorite story, I don't know. I, I love them all in their own way, you know? Right. Right. Um, I think the most, for me, the most moving chapter, and I can't, even now, if I can't reread it without feeling um, a tremendous sense of loss, was the chapter on Vietnam. Right. And the young men, 18 of them, who, who sacrificed their lives, um, 18 young men from Illyria. And uh, I told that chapter through the lens of two different people. One was an army nurse who actually did go to MB Johnson School of Nursing. And the other was a woman whose brother was killed in the war. And, and I have to tell you that when, when the book came out, I, I called Mary uh, Malden, whose brother had died in the war. And I told her that I, uh, I had the book and I wanted to come by and see her and, and um, give her a copy. And she just cried. Aww. She just sat there and just cried. Uh, and it was like I had brought her, her brother back to life for a moment. Yeah. And, and I think that's what I love about storytelling is the fact that you're, you're taking something that existed and you're giving it permanence. And it will last. I mean, these stories will last. This book will last. And I wrote this book in many ways to honor my parents, uh, mm -hmm. especially my father, who was born right. and raised in Illyria. He died when I was 13. And I'd like to think that, um, you know, that he knows about this. He's on the cover, by yeah. the way. He's, <laughs> he's the guy driving the Cadillac convertible. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Marcy. Uh, Tim, tell me, I know you, you, uh, you, you, you talk a little bit in your book about Keys Beach and, and, and you say that John S. Knight, was he actually on the USS Missouri? Is that right? Yeah, John S. Knight actually went on a tour of the Pacific, which was uh, quite a journey because it took, obviously, traveling to the Pacific was thousands of miles uh, back then. It took quite a bit of time. So he happened to be traveling when uh, the nuclear bombs were dropped and the Japanese suddenly surrendered when nobody expected them to. And since he was uh, obviously a journalist, he owned newspapers throughout the country, he uh, uh, took the opportunity to be on the battleship Missouri to witness the uh, signing, which really surprised me. And again, uh, I would have been interested to know that uh, the guy who was famous in our hometown was actually on the Missouri to witness that famous signing. It seems to me that the things you're talking about today point to a a failing of the way we teach history <laughs> yeah because well, you being from you know you should you should have learned that maybe not the rest of us in ohio yeah. but you should have learned about john s knight being on the missouri or 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 or, or uh, goodyear you know doing the the, the, the blimps for anti-submarine warfare. I, I grew up in columbus and i'm interested in the submarine uh <laughs> yeah. in the that sounds amazing <laughs> Doesn't it sound yeah. great? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think uh, from the local perspective, I'm surprised that nobody wanted to, you know, put it in the curriculum for the decade, especially since it was right there. You could have added it into teaching history, uh, you know, in the 50s, 60s and whatnot, and it just never got put in there. Uh, Akron Public Schools did buy a few books to, you know, for their teachers and whatnot, so hopefully some of them will be adding uh, that stuff in. But it's, it is very fascinating local perspective that uh, John S. Knight was such a an important person. And, uh, yeah, like Elise said, with the Goodyear blimp uh, hunting subs, who would have thought that they would have been uh, uh, doing that? They actually never sunk a sub, but they were great at spotting them, hovering over the water, seeing deep. So subs couldn't get to the surface to fire on ships when there was a blimp around. And only one ship was sh shot down, and the Caribbean, a German U-boat, surfaced, and they got out on top of the sub and took out machine guns and shot this blimp down. And uh, So that's the only time a blimp was, sunk, was uh, shot down during the war, was in the Caribbean by the Germans. Gotcha. Um... Uh, you know that's it, it, that's interesting to me. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, cartoonist Webb Brown. Did you what help describe the cartoons that you looked at to, as you were doing your research? Yeah, so I stumbled upon those in my research in the Beacon Journal, and uh, his cartoon work was really good. Um, and from what I've seen, he's one of the best in the country. So I quitted forty of his cartoons in uh, World War II Akron, 
And then I decided to do a book on his cartoons entirely. So my second book is on is uh, telling the story of the war through uh, 237 of his cartoons from 1934 through 1945 in chronological order. So his artwork is really good. He, he's very knowledgeable about history. Uh, he was also at the top of his game uh, when he was uh, making those cartoons. He retired in 1945. Uh, he was born in 1876. So, I mean, he retired after making cartoons, drawing cartoons for 46 years in 1945. He essentially came back from the Spanish-American War and, made, and uh, did cartoons for various newspapers uh, and businesses for 46 years. A very interesting guy. He lived to be 98 years old and was doing artwork up until he, up until he died at age 98 in the 1970s. So, uh, yeah, from what I saw, he's probably one of the best, if not the best, cartoonists in the country. Not that well-known because he only did work. He bounced around different newspapers. He was with the Beacon Journal in 1929 through 45, but he's never syndicated. If you want to be famous as a cartoonist, you almost have to be syndicated. So his artwork right. uh, was not nationally known, but his artwork was really fantastic. And uh, yeah, so yeah. if you get an opportunity, that's one of the things you'll like in the book. There's 108 Im images. Uh, 40 of them are his uh, great cartoons, which haven't been seen since uh, the late 1930s or the 1940s. So I was lucky. I, was, uh, I made the effort to get those in the book, which uh, is hard to do. That sounds like a really great uh, exhibit at some museum once museums open back up is a, is, is a is all of his cartoons, you know, that people could go through and, and take a look at. I wonder if he's in the, um, you, this doesn't matter, but um, the Cartoon Research Library in Columbus. I, I bet he, they've got some of his. Uh, they have like a, only like a couple, but they oh, do have a, a little bit on him. Yeah, they do have a little bit on him, but not a, not a lot. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I was lucky to, to find what I what I did, but uh, yeah, he's a great cartoonist. They do have a little bit on him and that, that that cartoon museum is great down there in Columbus. Right. Uh, David and Elise, I, I, um, I, I want to give you a shot at the same question. It's which of your children do you like the most? It, is there one story that you... <laughs> <laughs> it's me. I'm, I'm the child he likes the most. <laughs> <laughs> what am I talking about? Of course it's Elise. <laughs> um, but is there one story that, you, that really stuck to you that was either poignant or uh, inspirational or... Mm. I've got one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the thing about the book we were doing is the challenge of coming up with images to use to illustrate it. Mm -hmm. And I ran across the story of a slave, he was associated with the Rumley uh, community, Reuben Williams. He was, had a wife named Jemima. And they escaped from their slave owner. Uh, Reuben killed him. That's how he escaped. And they were being chased down through the swamps and everything. They had a infant child with them. And, you know, in order to make their escape, I mean, Reuben was you know, fighting off the dogs and all this. Whole thing. It's a, an awful wow. story. But trying to keep the child quiet. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, Jemima accidentally smothered it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, she was heartbroken. They were able to escape. Mm -hmm. She was heartbroken, taken in by the Quakers. And the Quakers made a death mask of the child's face. Wow. For her to remember by. A friend of mine who is a collector of all manner of things has the death mask. And he the story behind how he got it, you know, he, he mm -hmm. went down to Kentucky where some really racist guy lived who collected really bizarre stuff, who didn't know the history of it, and he got it from him. But we were able to get it and photograph it and put it in the well, the book. He, 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 he basically implied to the man in telling him his history that it may be a haunted piece yeah. of that, that, yeah. that this might it, not be something that someone who is as racist as the guy he got it from uh, would want to keep in his home because, <laughs> you know, the, the, the spirits would have reason to dislike him. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting, though, is, is he uses this when he goes around and talks about this particular community as a visual aid. And when he found it, and, it, and it, currently, the guy had it under candles, and it was a wax mask. But the candle wax was dripping down on the on the child's cheeks, and it looked like tears. Oh, and he that's didn't amazing. Want, he didn't want me to publish the photo with the tears on it because that's right. part of his story. So I had to Photoshop those away to show you what the mask looked like mm -hmm. underneath the tears. But it's just amazing to, to go out and you know the, as we say these are vanished communities mm -hmm. and to find a few relics of them 
know, in collector's hands somewhere. So you're that's uh, that's amazing. Yeah, stories. That's got to be so exciting. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you hear about a place. You know, I've heard about Carthagena. I'm 71 years old. I've heard about it since I was a child, and to actually be able to go in and touch something that was from it in a collector's you know collection mm -hmm. is just amazing. That is, yeah, that's something. Um, uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left. I think we're getting probably close to the end of our hour. Um, uh, any last words, a question I didn't ask you that you'd like to just address or something? What else would you like to say uh, about your book? And we'll start with Kathy. Unmute myself, okay. Yes. Um, what do I want to say about my book? Uh, one of the things that, that, is, that is in the book that I found uh, in these papers is a poem that was written um, by a man who actually didn't emigrate in 1817. Uh, he emigrated 15 years later, but he wrote it about their trials in Germany and their voyage overseas and then becoming a communal society here in Ohio. And um, uh, I had it translated and it really is a great coda, I think, for the, for the book. And no one had ever seen it before. And uh, it's, it, it really, as I said, they were not, a, they didn't keep diaries and they didn't write very many letters. And so it's, it's a really great way of at least getting an idea of the way that they felt. Um, it, that's got to be just really special. And, and to be introducing this basically to the world, you know. <laughs> it sat there for all those small decades. World of, yeah. of communal scholarship, yes, that very small world. <laughs> uh, Marcy, I'll throw it to you too. Well, I think as I was working on the book and putting it all together, I was thinking about what it meant to be doing what I was doing, to be time traveling, which is essentially what I think we all do when we're writing about the past. And even for me, it was my own past, it was fairly recent past, still there have been seismic changes um, from then to now. and. I just kept thinking about this wonderful quote from L.P. Hartley, uh, his book, The Go-Between. Um, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Yeah. And that's what I just kept in mind as I was working on this. We don't, I have to show you this. Um, I can pull it out because it's not really hooked to the wall. But, um, <laughs> sorry. It's hooked to my chair. Can you see this? Yes, I thought uh, that's what that was. <laughs> one of the women I interviewed who was an operator at the Illyria Telephone Company just a couple weeks ago called me and said she wanted me to have her vintage phone. Oh. She's living in a retirement center now with her husband. And, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, you know, she was still thinking about this and she wanted me to try to somehow get over there so that I could have this. And so, you know, all of us wearing masks, I, I saw her from afar, you know, I waved to her right. from the vestibule, but you know, these are treasures. These are treasures that, you know, they're, they're artifacts of the past and here we go. And uh, that's, been, that's really, amazing. I really wish it worked. I'd love for it to work. <laughs> now my next um, thing I need is an Hermes 300 uh, typewriter. That's that's the next thing on my wish list. Exactly. Tim, last words about your book? Uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the interesting things that I haven't touched on is um, about 70% of the, the men who were killed during World War II uh, for Akron and the United States as a whole happened in the last, uh, basically the last year of the war between May 30, uh, June 1st, 1944 and May 31st, 1945. So that really stunned me to see that uh, 972 of the 1,500 uh, men that were killed in World War II died in the last 12 months. Uh, I, I kind of thought, well, everybody, you know, people were dying in battle, 42, 1943, 1944, but it was really that 12-month period, um, June 1st, 1944, through May 31st, 1945, 
where they were trying to get the Germans to surrender. And then towards the end there, the Battle of Iwo Jima and the Battle of Okinawa in 1945, which are the bloodiest battles in the Pacific. So it, those uh, horrific casualties were really hitting home. And that kind of uh, showed me why they decided to drop the nuclear bomb, is we were taking heavy casualties. Our workforce and our soldiers were getting exhausted. They were talking about sending the guys from Europe over to the Pacific to help finish out the job. So um, it, it was really kind of a, uh, you know crazy to see that that many guys died in that uh, short of time period. And I don't think a lot of, again, going by how history is taught, uh, I don't think they've taught that uh, the majority of the casualties happened in a 12-month period during World War II. And uh, a lot of American families were devastated by uh, the telegrams arriving at their house, on the, uh, letting them know that their loved one was killed. And just to illustrate that, July 1st, 1944, there was not one family in Akron, Ohio, that had lost more than one son. Fast forward to July 1st, 1945, there were 15 families that had lost two sons in World War II. The casualties were so horrific in that 12-month time period. Holy smokes, yeah. That's that's amazing. I, I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, I wanted to thank, again, our panelists, um, Tim Carroll, Kathleen Fernandez, Elise Myers-Walker, and David Myers, and Marcy Rich, and to remind people that you can get copies of the books by each uh, each of our authors um, from the Book Loft of German Village at bookloft.com. Uh, thanks again to our festival sponsors and partners, and thank you for joining us on this very unusual Ohio Anna Book Festival panel. Um, and please check out the Ohio website for all of this year's festival programming. And there's still, it's still very uh, rich and robust and there's a lot of it. So thanks very much, everybody.